Good morning. Welcome to another YouTube sermon. Today we're moving on beyond the oracles to Isaiah 24 from the NIV. See, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It will be the same for priest as for people, for the master as for his servant, for the mistress as for her servant, for seller as for buyer, for borrower as for lender, for debtor as for creditor. The earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken this word. The earth dries up and withers. The world languishes and withers. The heavens languish with the earth. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore a curse consumes the earth. Its people must bear their guilt. Therefore earth's inhabitants are burned up, and very few are left. The new wine dries up and the vine withers, all the merrymakers groan. The joyful timbrels are still, the noise of the revelers are stopped, the joyful harp is silent. No longer do they drink wine with a song, the beer is bitter to its drinkers. The ruined city lies desolate, the entrance to every house is barred. In the streets they cry out for wine, all joy turns to gloom. All joyful sounds are banished from the earth, the city is left in ruins, its gate is battered to pieces. So will it be on the earth and among the nations, as when an olive tree is beaten, or as when gleanings are left after the grape harvest? They raise their voices, they shout for joy. From the west they acclaim the Lord's majesty. Therefore in the east give glory to the Lord, exalt the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, in the islands of the seas. From the ends of the earth we hear singing, glory to the righteous one. But I said, I waste away, I waste away, woe to me, the treacherous betray, with treachery the treacherous betray. Terror and pit and snare away to people of the earth. Whoever flees at the sound of terror will fall into a pit. Whoever climbs out of the pit will be caught in a snare. The floodgates of the heavens are opened, the foundations of the earth shake. The earth is broken up, the earth is split asunder, the earth is violently shaken. The earth reels like a drunkard, it sways like a hut in the wind. So heavy upon it is the guilt of its rebellion that it falls never to rise again. In that day the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. They will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. They will be shut up in prison and be punished after many days. The moon will be dismayed, the sun ashamed, for the Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders with great glory. Amen. <coughs> Let's pray. And now may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our God and our Redeemer. Amen. Everything must go. As we leave behind the oracles in Isaiah, we come to Isaiah's contemplation of the end of the world. It might seem there's no connection between what we've just been looking at, but there is. The point of those oracles was divine punishment for sin, especially pride, and the folly of trusting in human beings for salvation. That's what we have here and actually in the next three chapters. Whereas the oracles highlighted historical examples of human pride and how God would deal with it, here is God's solution to the problem of sin on a global, even cosmic scale. As this chapter shows, there is catastrophe and absolute destruction, but not for their own sake. Rather, it's so that God can bring in the new. Remember, oracles were there to teach God's people that they could rely on him. He was on their side, if they would only trust him. Scaled up, that's what we have here, the ultimate victory of God and the final redemption of his people. Over the next four chapters, that's including this one, we see the grandest scene unfolding. The old order of things, the whole of Babylon, the city of chaos, which is literally... Um, what Isaiah calls this world city, the city of chaos, is done away with because of its sins. Then God brings about the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem in which he will be with his people and reign for eternity. As you might have gathered, this chapter is the very beginning of that process. You might also have gathered from the allusions I've made to the book of Revelation that many conservative Christians see these chapters as an overview of what we read at the end of the New Testament the Great Tribulation, the Millennium, the Second Coming. Now, I don't doubt for one second that Isaiah and Revelation are showing us the same events, although, as I've said before, I prefer not to be dogmatic about matters such as the Millennium. 
That's especially important for this chapter because there's nothing here about the means by which the world ends or anything like a sequence of events. It's not a manual of how or when. Instead, the focus is very much on the why. Human sin has affected the natural order, indeed the whole creation. Therefore, all things must be made new. Now, although Isaiah doesn't tell us how the world ends, he is crystal clear about it being a work of God. There might be involved in all of this man-made disasters, such as mass pollution or nuclear war, or there might be catastrophic natural events. But whatever the cause or causes behind them all is God. The Lord will lay waste the earth and devastate it, and it will be completely laid waste. Nor is this mere speculation about the end times. This will happen because God has spoken his word. That's the guarantee. The devastation, we're also told, affects every kind of person, everywhere and everyone. Every class of person, the respectable, the nobility, the rich, the poor, those in authority and the humble alike are all caught up. The consequences are dreadful. Isaiah portrays global human city as a uh, human society as a city literally the city of chaos the world order opposed to god the judgment of god and the punishment meted out reduces the city to silent almost empty ruins the everyday aspects of life are brought to a halt the celebration of harvest and new wine are gone festivities are all forgotten Amidst the ashes, there will be those crying out, out, crying out for wine, for something to help them forget the horror, but nothing will work. I'm sure many of you have seen photographs of a city devastated by war, ruined and defenseless, with only remnants of buildings rising above the rubble. That will be the whole earth and all of human society. The survivors will be pitifully few, like the unpicked grapes and olives after the harvest. But why? Why does all this happen so that the inhabitants of the earth are burnt up with very few left? Why must the earth and the whole world dry up and languish and wither away? Because the earth is defiled. Not by pollution or human overpopulation, but by sin. We human beings have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes and broken the everlasting covenant. Because Isaiah is speaking of all humanity, is not referring to the laws and the statutes in the law of Moses, nor the covenants that bound God to his people. It's the unwritten laws and statutes, natural law, the understanding of right and wrong that's engraved in our consciences. The Bible tells us that the reality of God is proclaimed by the beauty and the complexity of the world around us. Yet we've all rebelled against all of these. We deny the reality of God and God's right to determine how we live. So it's the covenant of God and Adam, of creator and human creature, that we've turned against. And so the curse that consumes the earth is caused by the guilt of humanity, the guilt of sin. The Bible tells us that God cannot tolerate sin by his holiness and perfection. He is implacably opposed to it and will root it out. The Bible also tells us that sin pervades and distorts all of our relationships. So it turns man against nature, man against man, and man against God. So in that sense, the earth is not simply caused by second hand by our sin and our guilt, but because of what we literally do. Everything is rendered unclean and unfit for purpose. And so everything must go. There is the depiction of stunned and horror-struck silence and destruction, yet even amidst the ruins there is the voice of praise uplifted in joyful song. Across the ruined world the name of God will be exalted and glory will be given to God. It's not clear whether these are believers struggling for the end times or those who have come to faith as they recognize God at work at the end of all things. But Isaiah cannot join in, not even in anticipation, because he foresees what is to come. Even in the end times, human nature will not change. There will still be treachery and betrayal, because sin warps and poisons all of our relationships, even when 
there is nothing left to fight over and nothing left to win. Finally, though, a new day will dawn with the light of the living God himself. He will vanquish his enemies, both heavenly and earthly, con conquering the most powerful amongst his creation. They will be imprisoned and punished. We catch but a glimpse in this chapter of the new beginning as the Lord reigns gloriously on Zion and Jerusalem before all the elders. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Now, it's obvious, I hope to all of us, that that's a quote from Revelation chapter 4. And I'm quoting from that chapter because it does seem to parallel what we've just been reading about at the end of Isaiah, the chapter in Isaiah. And there is no denying that this passage dovetails with what a lot of what we read in the book of Revelations. So, for example, that reference to God imprisoning his enemies. Well, in Revelations, there is a reference to the thousand year binding of and imprisonment of Satan in the abyss. And it does seem likely, at least, that Isaiah is alluding to the same event. Nonetheless, as I said at the start, I find that such precise discussions on the end times simply cause believers to fall out amongst themselves to no great purpose. On the other hand, the very fact that this passage depicts the end times with such brutal clarity tells us that this is important and how serious this is. I was, as, no, as I was writing this, put my teeth in, I was thinking of the thoroughness with which the earth's population is dealt with. That language of fleeing but being inevitably snared and trapped. The remorseless and complete breakdown of everything, physical, spiritual, supernatural, social, whether in the heavens or in the cosmos. But we mustn't lose sight of the fact that all of this is the prelude to what comes afterwards, something unimaginably greater, more joyful, rendered perfect. Now we only catch a glimpse of that at the end of this reading. And in one sense, that's the application of a passage like this. The thoroughness with which the old order has to pass away before the glorious new beginning can be ushered in. And frankly, if you delve into a passage like this in too much detail, then we end up with the same, to my mind, fruitless discussions about the exact nature of the end. What I would like to explore, or at least point out, is what this passage tells us about the nature and the consequence of sin. And many commentators have noticed that this passage has echoes of the story of the flood, in the sense of doing away with what exists to make way for a new beginning, and for the same reason, the presence of sin. There's also something of the Genesis account of order coming from chaos. God overcomes the chaos caused by sin by bringing in the goodness and orderliness and perfection of the new creation. That's how serious sin is, how much it pollutes and stains and profanes everything it touches. So much that it bars the unsaved from God's presence forever, and the cosmos itself has to be healed and restored. I don't think our imaginations allow us to grasp the scale of the problem. Now, you may remember when the Large Hadron Collider first went online, there were many jokes about whether the scientists responsible knew what they were doing and they might end the world by accident. And if someone were to ask us, how bad is sin? How serious is it? Because in our postmodern world, one of our attitudes is to say, how serious can anything be? How serious is sin? Our answer must be bad enough to bring about the end of the world. Amen.